chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. I invite you to turn with me to your sermon notes, and if you choose to, follow along with me. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where, where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Friends, this, this is God's word for us this morning. George Stratton lived... Um, Approximately a hundred years ago, um, can't remember exactly when he was born. George George Stratton was an inventor, an American inventor. His claim to fame was that he invented a pair of these. Some of y'all are wearing them, but they're different than the ones that you're wearing them. I hope they're different because the pair of eyeglasses that George Stratton invented was inverted eyeglasses. Now, in a nutshell, what that meant was this, that when you put them on, everything was turned upside down. Now, why somebody would do that, I'm not totally sure. I, um, he, he was gone before I figured it, that I found out that he had, um, had invented these, but it would be like when you put them on that you're standing on your head permanently. Now, if you want to know what that is like, ask Karen Ezell, because I've been told that that's what she does when she goes home, um, that she just stares there in York and is constantly standing on her head, and nobody knows why, but, um, but you know, as they would wear these glasses, interestingly, George Stratton wore them every waking hour for weeks and months at a time. Interestingly, when he did it, he, he admitted at first that it, it, it was really hard to get used to because the sky would, was at his feet and the ground was at his head when he poured a cup of coffee and the coffee went up into the cup. And, but he said eventually it got, he got used to it. think about it or try it and stand on your head and pour a cup of coffee and you'll see that it really does go up. Um, but eventually he got used to it. And he had learned to live in this upside down world. Where upside down had become normal. 
Now, why do I tell you that? It's, uh, it, it's an interesting little tidbit of history, but way more than that, I want to suggest to you that people have been living in an upside-down world for years. Wrong is called right. Right is called wrong. And we've gotten so accustomed to it that we're so used to it that it's normal. And anything abnormal is actually right side up. Interestingly, I think it's in Matthew chapter 12 that in the message translation, Jesus says this, in the, um, I can't remember which verse, but he says, I have come to set the world right side up. Because even nearly 2,000 years ago when Jesus began teaching that the world was already upside down, Maybe not as bad as today, but it was still upside down. Wrong was already being called right, and people were missing the most important things. But it was into this upside down world that Jesus came to set things right side up. Part of this upside down world has to do with the cross. Because in that upside down world, the cross is foolishness. Verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, we may not, it may be hard for us to think of the cross as being foolish. I, I'm going to guess some of y'all wearing the cross around your necks this morning. We have gold-plated crosses. We have two gold-plated crosses. We have an old rugged cross in the fellowship hall. We cherish the old rugged cross, don't we? I mean, we cherish it. How in the world could the cross be foolish? But Back when Jesus died on the cross and in Paul's day, the idea of a crucified Savior was ludicrous. In fact, for an early Christian, if they, um, if, if they even mentioned the Messiah being crucified, they were looked upon as a lunatic. Looked upon as if they were crazy. Because in the mindset of that day, the Messiah was supposed to be strong. The Messiah was supposed to come on a white horse and riding into Jerusalem and cracking the whip and delivering everybody with the show of force. But the idea that Jesus would come as a show of humanity and weakness was foolish. The cross, the idea of a crucified Savior was absolutely ludicrous. To the Romans, to the Greeks back then, it, it was ridiculous. Nobody could save by dying. It didn't make sense. By the way, um, they, they say that pictures of and images back in um, the early part of the church. Pictures and images of Jesus actually being on the cross didn't even appear until the 5th century. You know why? It's foolish. It was ridiculous. The old rugged cross hadn't even been written yet. You see, the idea of the cross, of the Messiah dying on the cross, was like an oxymoron. It would be like saying, icy cold hot, or flaming ice. Words and ideas 
that were put together but didn't go together because it was an oxymoron. It was ridiculous. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Show me the way. The way of the cross. So if verse 18 is true that to those who are perishing, the message of the cross is foolishness, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God, then to me the logical question then is, what then is the message of the cross? Because if on the one hand it's for those who are perishing, but on the other hand it's for those who are being saved, I better make sure I understand what the message of the cross is all about. So let me give you a couple of things. Number one, the cross is costly. It's costly. It wasn't cheap. It was costly. By the way, sin always costs somebody. Sin always costs somebody. Think of it this way. Imagine this afternoon that somebody knocks on your door and wants to borrow your car. And you being the good person that you are, you let them borrow your car. You give them the keys. Your car is parked in your garage. Now, when they get in the car, they crank it up, but they fail to check their rear view mirror. And when they, by failing to check their rear view mirror, they fail to recognize that the garage door is still down. So they put it into reverse, and they speed out of your driveway, knocking the garage door off the hinges, putting damage to your car. Now, but the problem is, is that your homeowners and, in, and car insurance, auto insurance policies, the deductible is so high that neither one will cover it. Somebody still has to pay, right? The debt won't vanish into thin air because somebody has to pay. When a wrong is done, somebody always has to pay. Either you're going to hold them accountable and make them pay, or you're going to pay the price for them. But either way, somebody has to pay. Now most sin, most wrongs, most things that happen cannot be understood in purely economic terms. Because what about that person who has robbed you of happiness, robbed you of contentment, gossiped about you, destroyed your reputation? When a sin is committed, when a wrong is done, somebody always has to pay. Either you make them pay or you pay. Jesus chose to pay. The price was costly. The message of the cross is that Jesus gave his life. The most costly price he could pay. Second thing I want to tell you about the cross is that the cross is sacrifice. It's sacrifice. Now, to sacrifice 
that literally means to give up yourself so that someone else can benefit. In baseball or in softball, if a batter squares around and sacrifice, lays down a sacrifice bunt, they give themselves up so another runner can advance to the next base. Sacrifice. Or how about this word? Have you ever known someone who is just emotionally needy? You know, you know who I'm talking about? Um, quit looking at me. Um, y'all yeah, know what I mean. Someone who is emotionally needy that when they talk to you that it just makes them feel so much better. But it drains you. You understand what I mean? To lift them up, you have to be brought down. Sacrifice means to bring someone else up. You must be willing to be brought down. To be drained of your energy. To be drained of your life so that someone else can live the way of the cross. And sacrifice. Who laid his life down so we could advance. Not merely to the next base, but so that we could live. It's an upside down world that we live in. The cross puts it right side up. Thirdly, the way of the cross. It's the way of power. It's the power of God. Verse 18. To us who are being saved. Notice how it doesn't say to us who have it all together. I love that phrase. Being saved. Being saved. It's a process. It, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Peter 2.24 says he himself, being, referring to Jesus, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness by his wounds, you have been healed. You know, for a long time, I have thought of the cross merely as about forgiving me for my sin. It is about forgiveness. But it's also about transformation. You see, the power of the cross can... Have, the cross has the power to forgive and to transform. To turn your world right side up. The power of the cross can not only treat you, and by the way, back earlier, I think I missed this, <coughs> forgiveness literally means Refusing to make them pay for what they did. Mm -hmm. Go back to your car in the garage. The power of the cross is not only about forgiveness, but it's about transformation. Making us a new person. Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. For so long, I thought of the cross as being strictly forgiveness. Where God sent Jesus to pay the penalty for my sin. And, and because of the cross, I can go to heaven when I die. And, and all of that is great. And all of that is 100% true. It's just not 100% complete. Because the cross is about transformation as much as it's about forgiveness. Because I've got to be honest, there have been times in my life I have already made up my mind how I'm going to be, how I'm going to live. The glasses that, that I look at this world through. And I don't want to change, but I just want God to forgive me. But he says, I do want to forgive you, but I also want to transform you. I want to make you into a new man. I want to give you a new pair of glasses to look at your world so that you can see your priorities and make your choices through my glasses rather than the upside-down world that you are currently living in where wrong is considered right and right is considered wrong. The path the sacrifice, the costliness of the cross. The cross. It's more than a piece of jewelry or something that you might hang on the wall as a decoration. Transformation. It, the message of the cross will turn your upside down world right side up. Because that's why Jesus came. Not to leave us the same way we've always been. That's the message of communion. The transformation. The power of the cross. Will you take your hymn on? Turn to page 12 with me. And as you do, I invite you to Go ahead and prepare yourself for communion. You may want to go ahead and get the wafer out of the little Ziploc bags and, um, and just kind of lay it aside. Keep the lid on the cup until it's time so, so we don't inadvertently spare it. But... Go ahead and get yourself ready. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ. Hear the good news. Christ Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners.
And that act proved God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. The next page is the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy. God's power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we face at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. you take his body. When 
was the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. the way of the cross is still considered foolishness to so many in an upside down world. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Go from here. Walking out, right side up, seeing the world, seeing light as Jesus died.